So we were billed as a panel of four. Uh, Kenza from Morocco is in the audience there. Um, we don't have a, a French translator in the building today, and she speaks much better in French than she does in English. But I hope, Kenza, you ask some questions of us, because the lady, uh, I've met her before, and she has got such a wealth of information about cannabis in Morocco, and she's written many papers. She now studies at Bordeaux University, specifically about cannabis and plants in general. And so I hope you have some input a bit later on, because I've seen some of her photos from Morocco, and I can tell you that it is one of the most majestic cannabis-producing valleys in the world. Uh, so, yeah, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Klepfer. I'm from uh, Hiroshima, uh, Japan. I go to the university at Hiroshima, Japan, and I uh, am from the United States originally, and I've been doing research on cannabis uh, in Nepal, in the case of Nepal, for the last year and a half, and I've, and I've been, yes? Oh, oh, to there. And um, I'd, I'd hoped to do some research as well in, in cannabis in Japan, uh, but currently the Regulations in Japan have become quite strict. There are cannabis farmers in Japan that require a licensing process, and uh, there's a very limited number of farmers in Japan compared to the traditional cannabis farmers. So um, it's, that's what's led my research to come to Nepal because there's a, a lot more farmers and arguably a lot more farmers who need forward-thinking policy on cannabis uh, uh, production, consumption. So this is what um, I'm hoping to talk to in the presentation. Okay, I can start? Okay. So my, my research title is <laughs> the, <clears throat> the Ishokuju of Hemp. Ishokuju is Japanese for clothing, food, and shelter. Uh, Nepali, uh, they also have the similar word. It's gas, bas, kopas. And it means clothing, food, and shelter. They have this in their language, and language is very important uh, when we think about how to uh, create these kinds of south-north uh, dialogue that we've come here to t discuss today. <clears throat> and how Ishokuju plays a role in investigating this production policy in place for a sustainable future. So hemp in Nepal, uh, around 3,000 tons of hemp cannabis grows naturally in Nepal, um, and you can see Towards the western part of the country is where you'd find most natural occurring cannabis. Uh, however, in the central part of the country, you can see there's, uh, there's places where cannabis cultivation takes place, but it's not this wild cannabis that we know. Uh, cultivation is actually grown. Um, however, from July 1973, there was a license, and grower and dealers' uh, licenses were all revoked. Um, in 1976, more... Uh, uh, controls were put on cannabis cultivation. So this made it more and more difficult uh, for cannabis growers uh, to have a, have a place in the society. Um, however, religious and indigenous knowledge still exist and uh, have existed in the past uh, through Ayurveda, but also many understandings and indigenous understandings of plants and local plants and materials in their regions for curing sicknesses. Uh, one example of cannabis in Nepal is that when their goats uh, eat too much food, they get diarrhea. Well, uh, how do they cure their goats? So it's not just medicine for uh, themselves, but it's medicine for their goats. They would feed the goats a little bit of cannabis and the diarrhea would be cured. So this is a great opportunity to use cannabis not only for feeding themselves, but Nepal is also a very food insecure nation when it comes to feeding their own animals. Most farmers in Nepal um, raise livestock whether it's chickens or cows, uh, buffalo, um, ducks, sheep, goats, and they need a food resource. So if they have to import that resource, that's one extra resource that they're gonna continue to have to import from other countries, and it's often food that the animals can't eat, like corn, or not, not naturally digestible, like corn. So these are some of the issues I could see uh, so far in, in Nepal's case. So it brought my research to uh, one region and one municipality in Tarakola, and this is in the western part of uh, Nepal. And I was able to interview 140 farmers in the region, um, going door to door, basically, and asking them uh, a set of questions, a survey, uh, mostly demographic survey, but as well as what their 
concept or what their understanding, what their use is of cannabis. Because cannabis, as we all know, has multiple uses. So what do the farmers use the cannabis for? What is it the most important for, and why is that important for, for them? The farmers need discussion and they need dialogue. It's often policymakers in the past 50 years that have governed the choices of farmers, but farmers have to govern themselves. And in my case, in this one case study that I've done, I've seen where self-governance can work or can be appropriate that's reflective of the policies in Nepal. So I really wanted to know what kind of seeds uh, farmers might grow and what attributes that, what's their end game What's their goal of growing cannabis in Nepal? You know, we might think that, um, and it's, it's often a misconception that you know, cannabis just goes wild all over the Himalayas. And yes, it does, but cannabis is cultivated. So why is it cultivated and what's the value there? So when we ask these questions, we have to, just like if you plant a tomato, right? If you plant a tomato, uh, what kind of tomato variety you plant um, will matter when it comes to what you're going to use that tomato for. Are you going to put it on a salad? Is it a cherry tomato? Is it a sauce tomato? There's so many variables that we can get from tomatoes. And just like with cannabis, we can get so many variables. But we don't know what variables those uh, are. So we need to ask questions. We have to ask the farmers, what are they hoping when they plant the seed? And what are they hoping to get from planting that seed? So do they want a high drug content or a high THC content plant? Do they want more seed yield? So when they plant one seed, can they get 100 seeds from that one plant? Or can they get 500 seeds? Is that valuable to them? What about the plant height? If the plant is two meters tall or four meters tall, what's the value there? And then what's the price? So farmers might have to pay a price one day for seeds. I think a lot of farmers in Europe, uh, maybe they have to pay a price for seeds. In California, if you're growing certain strains, you have to pay a price for that seed. Now, what price are you willing to pay for these seeds? It's very important, especially if you're a poor farmer living in these countries. What price are you willing to pay? And we need to know these kinds of things in order to either introduce new seeds or not touch them, not, uh, not allow these policies to be put in place where farmers then have to purchase the seed because maybe what they actually have, their land race varieties, are just as valuable or more valuable to them. So we have to start understanding this seed and where it comes from and what's its in value for the farmers. And so when I ask these questions, um, looking at these uh, charts here, this is uh, internal choice probability. I, after asking 140 farmers this question about what kind of seeds they would prefer and what their end result would be, honestly, if you see these airplanes that are right here and the center circle is the center of the airplane and these are the wings of the airplane, uh, if we're to the left of the center line or the right of the center line, we can make some decision or some understanding about it. And honestly, this uh, research and this result doesn't clearly state that they have any one preference for either one thing or the next. And maybe this is because the, the translations issues were there, or the wording was there. If you say bango or bang in Nepali, or if you say ganja, you're talking about two different things. So this was really important, the context and the language being used. Other issues are just overall understanding. Maybe legalization for farmers in Nepal, they don't quite understand this process because they don't, they don't regulate themselves based on governmental regulations. They have local legislation, local governance that's happening. And that's very important to the villages for uh, Nepali people. And so in that case, I was able to separate two villages out. One village had a local council meeting where they stated, in order to continue growing cannabis in this region so that the police do not come and cut their plants down, which is very common, it happens every single year in Nepal, on in, depending on the region, in order for this to stop happening, they had to come up with some local agreement with the local authorities and say, we will not cultivate for <laughs> drug purposes, because we, we don't need to cultivate for drug purposes, we want to cultivate for seed purposes. That was their goal, that was their hope, because seed and food Food is a livelihood. Uh, that's what they need. So when we separated the two villages, in, in this one you can see in the drug content, they were less likely, and this one would more likely, on the bottom, figure two, would more likely prefer maybe higher THC variety. And this might be because they use that as an insurance to mitigate some of the problems they have growing other crops like corn or soybeans or potatoes. If they have a bad crop, Cannabis acts as an insurance for these farmers. They can sell the buds, they can sell 
the, uh, the shake from the crop. They don't have really uh, unique or really technical ways of doing this. It's basically women sitting in circles rubbing crops in their hands. And they're able to, to make hash or make whatever product they need from this. And they can use that both at the home or they can sell it as an insurance. And this is very valuable for farmers in these cases. So I was able to ask a few other questions in my uh, research and find out a little bit more information. But my result, my main research study, uh, this preference study about seeds, didn't really give me a clear result. And so um, that was OK. However, it led me to find new information. Some new information was that rice uh, has a value of three to one. So hemp seeds at one kilo can be traded to three kilos of rice. So this adds value to the people when we talk about uh, stopping hunger. If farmers are no longer able to cultivate cannabis legally and they can't trade their hemp seeds for rice, then how are they going to have food? This is a big question we have to continue to ask ourselves. And then what about how cannabis is beneficial for society if it's properly managed and managed is cultivated, not letting it grow wild, but properly managed? We could see that 67% um, strongly agreed with this statement. So that's, that seems like um, there, there's some understanding or some consensus based on 140 uh, surveys that they have some idea that it is quite um, beneficial for their society. So when we look at the cannabis cultivation in Nepal, we can see here uh, in these two ways, it's, it's typically a seed crop. It's being hung up to dry. It's, it was green plants that were now browning. So we can harvest a lot of seeds from these materials. And it's typically grown on the edges of their terrace, not in big fields. Not, this is cultivated uh, cannabis in Nepal. So it's, it's grown on the edges of the fields. And when they do that, this acts as a windbreaker. So this agroecological uh, perspective to growing cannabis like this, that's usually not done in industrialized uh, nations. So at the end of the day, of course, after he's harvested all his cannabis, it also makes a nice sofa so you can relax and you can sit back on it. And, uh, and so he's, we can see here, again, the crops are cut. It acts as windbreaks. It acts as other, other values that you know, we really don't know much about. And this is a typical scene where the farmers would beat the uh, tops or the heads of the buds, and they can take that, and then they would separate out the leaf material, which then often gets added back into the fields as a mulch, as a compost for potatoes for the following season, and they separate out the seeds. Because the seed has the most value for their livelihood. Uh, average uh, households of the 140 houses surveyed, we could find that 50 kilos of hemp seeds were gathered from uh, each household. And so 50 kilos, and that's really, it's, it's not a lot by any of these industrial standards in Europe, but it's a lot to them because it adds, it adds rice, it adds nutrition. This is something that they're gonna eat almost every single day. You can see here at the bottom, there's a chutney that's often produced using uh, what's locally available. If the seeds are roasted and hand pressed, so it's a fresh source of highly nu nu nutrient and nutrient dense material. And that's what the people need there. Um, so in summary, uh, you know, what we need is more research. We need to increase the amount of research. Research has been done uh, in the industrial level, but still this traditional or this um, Indigenous use of cannabis is going to be really important if we're able to build an economy or build policy around the farmers here. And think about this need for a bottom-up development. Again, putting power in the hands of the farmers. One of the things I could notice in these villages is that they don't have an opportunity to process fibers. You know, so what do we, what, how do we get some processing, some fiber processing uh, more easily available to them. It's not big machines. It can often be small scale and small machines. It's just one step in the right direction, getting them more familiar the, with the materials. Introducing new ideas like hempcrete. This is something that was not, uh, not heard of in the villages, but it could be introduced gradually, maybe building uh, a wall or a, ha or, or a small shed or a toilet and getting them familiar with just the technology on a small scale. It doesn't have to be a big home. It can be very simple and very scaled up appropriately. Once they get used to materials and ideas and they understand these approaches, because they know it, they know they have the agroecological approaches already that are existing in Nepal. And so I would recommend you know, more observations and more study behavior, because this is where uh, researchers can come in and get more data collection, get more information, and then that information can be put into data and, and then shown to the policymakers that can actually lead 
uh, some change. I, and that's, so far, that's what I've, I've found in my research. And um, if you have any questions or ideas, please uh, feel free to discuss with us after our session. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Thomas. I'm going to do the photos. So the, um, the idea of this topic today is to talk about a north-south a north -south dialogue. So I'm quite a strange beast in that I'm from the north, but for 30 years I've lived in the south. And for 10 of those 30 years, I've been um, an activist for my human rights to be able to use cannabis. And my partner and I, Myrtle, in the audience there, we don't actually really care that much about hemp, and we really don't actually care that much about medicine. That's somebody else's discussion, and it's a good discussion. We are battling for the right to choose whether we want to use cannabis, because it's all I'm trying to do is have a choice. So when it comes to, when it comes to a north-south dialogue, as an activist, all I can see for hundreds of years is the north coming to the south to exploit the South. That is the only dialogue I see. So the Americans, the Americans invented what we now know as the war on drugs. But once upon a time, an Englishman arrived in South Africa and he was an army lieutenant colonel called C.W.J. Birchall. And he was the very first human being to ban somebody from using cannabis. Because on that ship that he came with, there were a couple of hundred Indian indentured laborers that they packed in Bombay tightly into the hold of a ship. And when they got out of the ship, they were told to go and work in the white man's sugarcane fields. And they brought with them their sacrament, which happened to be, bang, cannabis. And they smoked it in the field, and to that army officer, it looked to him that they would just slow down and get very lethargic about things. But what he didn't know was they could do that for 20 hours a day because cannabis took the pain away from working for the man from the north. They could work ad infinitum with cannabis. So the very first law pertaining to the prohibition of cannabis happened in a field in Natal in South Africa in 1878, fully 60 years before Harry Anslinger and the rest of them came along. So we've got a long and rich history of prohibition of one population group of another, because basically that's what prohibition is. So I'm going to start the next five minutes. I've just started my five minutes with the fact that I don't think there is a dialogue between the North and the South unless the North is being condescending and preaching to the South. And I've even heard it today on this stage. I heard it yesterday on this stage. We're American and we know how to do it. We knew how to invent the war on drugs and now we have invented how to get rid of the war on drugs, follow our lead. So how about... Whoa. The story I'm going to tell is about this dialogue. And what you see there is a picture that appeared in a national newspaper in South Africa. And that is a Bell 206 helicopter. And it was given to the South African government in the mid-1990s from the DEA. They gave them away because they were old. So we'll just give away all our old stuff to the third world. And they left a note with it that said, spray the cannabis, because that's what we've been doing forever. So the South African government started spraying cannabis. And this wasn't an apartheid government. This was an ANC government. This is black government spraying black people's crops. Bizarre. But the North had spoken. The 1961 convention, the 1927 convention, the 1986 convention, they're all there in black and white for the government to read. And they believed that spraying crops to eradicate them was the way to go. So one day... They started spraying, and Myrtle and I got their hell in. We drove 14 hours to the helicopters in our vehicle through the night, and I, woke, I drove through security, and I got to the helicopter, and I put an I Love Dacha sticker straight on the side of it and filmed it and put it on social media so they know we're here and they know we're watching. We actually ended up doing a documentary about it, 
And we went into the fields to prove that not only are they spraying the cannabis, they're spraying all the corn because it's grown as a companion plant. And it's not grown to put in a plastic bag to send to market for someone to get stoned from. That's the furthest from the truth. So they decided to indiscriminately start spraying. This is in 2015. And we went into a field four days after, sorry, two days after the helicopter had left. And this farmer said, why are they doing this? If they told me to my face that I wasn't allowed to grow cannabis, I would stop growing cannabis. But I've been doing it for six, seven, eight generations. We grow it for fiber, we grow it for fuel and bedding, just like the, Thomas described the people in Nepal. These are subsistence farmers. And they are very confused about this north-south dialogue because they didn't have a dialogue with these guys. In fact, one of the most amazing... That, there you go. There, there is the devastation two days later. In the foreground, that used to be cannabis. In the midground, that is corn that is completely unfit for human consumption. That's why the farmer's confused. Why are they killing all my food? I can't fill my family. And in the, in the deep background there through the forest, you can still see patches of green where it was indiscriminately airborne. There's too much wind and it just goes everywhere. We went to a village 40 kilometers from a main road. And this woman is also confused about this north-south dialogue. Who are these people to say that they've got to bring the helicopter to spray all my crops? So now all my cattle have got diarrhea. Now we can't use the water because they're spraying glyphosate all over the countryside. So Myrtle and I made this documentary and it ended up in Parliament because we, got it to, we, we, did, we made it that way. And since that point, a helicopter hasn't been back at all. We're waiting for them to come back because Colombia is already putting the mechanisms together to start spraying again because they were under pressure from the north to do so because all of that southern hemisphere narcotic is going up to the north. So they're trying to stop it at source. So this woman had the same complaints about the north. But this kid, he just goes about his daily business of going down to the field to pick some heads of cat to take back so his cattle can lie on it at night because you want to know how cold it gets in these valleys at night. So they use it for fiber and fuel and bedding and this child has absolutely no idea why the helicopters are spraying. But the man in the village said, why are they doing this? And we said, well, do you know how much it costs to do this? It costs 26,000 South African rand to run a helicopter, a bell helicopter, for one hour. So the man said, well, why don't they just come and buy my weed and throw it in the sea? And I couldn't fault what he said, because that's what they should be doing. If they're trying to eradicate cannabis, we'll put it all into parcels for you. You can throw it in the sea. But pay the man, and let's just get this straight. He had a, an entire year's harvest, and he wanted 5,000 rand for the harvest, which is something in the region of, oh, uh, 1,500 US dollars, less, 1,200 US dollars for his complete harvest. That's all he wanted for it. But no, they prefer to eradicate it because that's what the North told them. So now we've been hearing all sorts of things about legalization and how you should do it and how you should stop the war on drugs and this is the way forward. But not one person on this stage with this microphone over the last two days has been to a country that is legalized with 350,000 traditional healers. Because these guys have been using cannabis for over 600 years for everything. They even tell people to smoke it as medicine because they know that to, for some conditions, it's excellent to be smoked. It titrates immediately. They see a result immediately. So we are fighting very hard for the rights of these people in the South, because there's not many of these people in the North. It's, a, it's so far away from a Northern paradigm, it's scary. So we have to make sure that our particular legalization in South Africa includes these people. And is actually, they're pretty much all women as well. So let's cut a couple of years and go to last year, and there was a headline in the newspaper that said, Lesotho, the first country in Africa to legalize cannabis. And we went, no way. 
there's no way that could possibly be true. So I got a crew and a vehicle and two cameras, and I went to Lesotho to make sure that we found out who was lying about it. And what we found was there was a whole bunch of people from the north, and they all had under-the-table licenses from the, South, the Lesotho government to start pioneering in one of the most brutal countries on earth. They're trying to grow cannabis in this place. But their cannabis is different to Lesotho cannabis because Lesotho cannabis just grows all over the place. All over the place. This is now four hours into the, into the mountains at an average speed of 30 k's an hour on these hectic, hectic roads. And you finally get to this. And this is called Matakwani. And Matakwani is the South, the, 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 the Lesotho, the Basotho term for cannabis in, its, in general. Not even sativa, not indica, not nothing. Just Lesotho cannabis. And it's been growing like this for six, seven hundred years. And it's particularly unique, this stuff. Um, there are tests done. We are doing tests on it now. There's some incredible properties to be had from these things. But the people from the north actually don't care about that because they bring their own genetics with them. And we think, well, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt because maybe if they bring all of these people, they bring their factories and they bring all of their cannabis to grow, maybe they will empower the Basutu nation to become wealthy. They were, but then I thought, well, maybe they're just employing them for slave labor, like they've been doing for 450 years in Africa, the people from the north. It gets worse than that. Last week at a conference in Johannesburg, we were with two Lesotho non-profit company organizers on the ground, and they said, it's worse than your ni worst nightmare. Not only are they, uh, they, they are basically not employing anybody. They bring some Canadians, and the whole thing is automated. It's on a switch. So they don't employ anybody. They don't empower anybody. But they have this terrible decision to make now, because none of them can get the cannabis out of the country. Because there's no international airport apart from Johannesburg. And now they're stuck with 20 tons of weed that they can't get anywhere. Because they didn't think of that. Because all they wanted to do was be first. To be the pioneer. To say to their stock and shares holders, wow, we've got the first license. We're going large. We're going far. We're going to be the top. But now they can't get their weed out of Lesotho. So this goes as far as the eye can see. It, is, it hasn't been planted. It just falls where it is. And you'll see, maybe there's another slide somewhere. That is three pioneers in the middle. This is a tough job, eh? This is a tough job going to find cannabis like this. This takes... A, it's self-seeded. It just sits there forever and ever. What they do, they contain it with um, uh, trees and thorns so the cattle can't get to it till it's as big as it can get. And then they just use it for bedding. There's no culture of them using it for seed. There's no real culture of using it to smoke in this condition because it's pretty much unsmokable. But we've done tests on this particular, that particular field and it's running at 3 to 5% THC just like any land race you would probably find anywhere in southern Africa. There, there's the, that's the kind of kraal that they use. And the other thing I'd like to point out is it's nobody's cannabis. It's everybody's cannabis. It's the whole community's cannabis. This is not fenced off at somebody's house. This is a whole valley that the valley owns. And if you want to get into the realms of intellectual property rights, the people from the north are starting to cop on about this. And now they want the seeds of this stuff because maybe there is something amazing within it. So now I have a mission in the, in the coming years to protect this from the north. Because the North are coming, just like they've been coming for 400 years, to rape and pillage Africa. And this time it's green gold and not diamonds, and it's not copper, and it's not zinc, and it's not hardwood from the forests. It's weed. If you can see the very, very light green there, that is pasture for cattle. If you see the mid-green stuff, that is corn. And in the foreground underneath the cliff, I'd say... 40 kilometers in a straight line, it's just cannabis. And it hasn't been put there, it is there. And you think that the people from the north like that as an idea, they don't like that idea at all. Now, if I was a Canadian and I was trying to get a license, I would probably go down there and figure out what all that stuff is. But they don't, they don't care. They actually, the people from the north, oh, they know best. They, they're just gonna bring their own stuff and do their own thing. 
So there's got the only thing that I can think of that actually brings the North and the South together, as far as cannabis goes, is the culture of cannabis and the people that use cannabis. Because while I've been here for the last 48 hours, I've talked to the four corners of the earth, and most of us have one thing in common. It is the culture of cannabis that brings us together as people. But most of the people in the North that are dictating to the South with their helicopters and their licensing and their exclusivity, they don't care about cannabis culture because they don't use cannabis as a culture. So my takeaway from this is um, I am... You can see I get hot under the collar about it. I, in Johannesburg, I actually have an hour and a half presentation called Cannabis Britannica about how the English have actually forced their way around the world and they've subjugated population groups in the name of narcotics. It's nothing to do with the narcotic. It's to do with population control. And they still do it to this day. So my back is always up when the North comes to town and they start going, you know what you should do? We know what we should do. The traditional healers have been doing it for 600 years. We know exactly what. We don't need anybody to tell us what to do in the South. We'd like a bit of a help achieving our goals and not having closed meetings with governments about the next license. Because nobody who has a license in Southern Africa at the moment wants anything to do with legalization. They want to be first. They want the monopoly. They want to be in charge. So I'm hoping the next time I go to this valley... Um, it will be fully legal in Lesotho, but it is all going to take time. So um, I'm sorry to, if I appear to be ranting and raving. I've been told I've been a zealot before, but I'm just passionate about where I live in southern Africa and the people from the north coming to the south to try and get whatever's in it for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am from Mesoamerica, uh, and actually we don't have a traditional use or, uh, of cannabis, but we have a traditional use of psilocybin. And actually we have a cultural use of cannabis. Uh, when we have the, some uh, more than one century to use uh, cannabis in El Salvador, and actually in Mesoamerica, when we have a, a historical uh, register when France uh, began the work of the Panama Canal in the finals of the 19th century. And uh, we have a lot of poems in the region about the use of cannabis uh, for the workers in the Panama Canal. And now we have in the Mesoamerica, the most uh, violence uh, for the war on drugs. Uh, specifically, we have more violence in the Northern Triangle of Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Uh, for the UNODC, the, um, Guatemala is the major producer of cannabis in the region. And actually, for the UN, the, cannab the more cheap cannabis in the black market is in Guatemala. You can buy uh, one pound of cannabis with less of one US dollar. And uh, in the last eight years, the United States put uh, a lot of money in this region uh, for the war on drugs. For example, in El Salvador, uh, the government received more than $13 million, uh, infrastructure, uh, equipment, uh, for combat the, the narcs. And the police, this uh, elite unit, uh, do this. This is the, the big narc for the north. Look, the narcs for the north. This is, that is the money of the taxes of the north. Look, in the region, we uh, uh, have a lot of rural farmers working for the drug trafficking organization because they don't have any other opportunity. And uh, uh, they criminalize 
you see this is a child. So that is a, a official tweet of the police of El Salvador. This is the uh, 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 hit against the narcs. <laughs> Look. In this operative, they uh, spend more than a million dollars and move tanks in the city, and that's all they uh, ink out, three dollars of cannabis. And uh, now we have more than a, 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 sorry, <laughs> 5,000 percent of sober overpopulation in the prisons, uh, only for cannabis. Actually, the percentage of the uh, incautations, you can stay than, uh, five, between five and 10 years in jail for less than 25 grams of cannabis. But if you see the statistics of the governments, uh, you cannot see uh, people in the prison for more than one kilo of cocaine. So this is what the North do in my region. And thank you. I put a, a, a more beautiful photo. <laughs> I can, I can, I can, I can, yeah, yeah, sit, 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 I can see you. Okay. So, yeah. I, I want to have uh, to do a comment uh, because you say about uh, the fierce uh, prohibition, and I I don't agree <laughs> because I actually published a, a article about uh, Innocence Eight in the 15th century. Actually, uh, this pope uh, in the Catholic Church. The, the unique sin they can forgive is uh, insult to the Holy Spirit. And the 15th century, uh, this pope put the use of cannabis in the same level. <laughs> so, reading the lines. <laughs> 300 years later, yeah, yeah. years before. Um, I seem to be remember that um, one of the, uh, the Ottoman Turk kings banned caffeine as well at one point. So it just proved, and, it, and uh, okay, uh, in Mate, right. Well, that just goes to prove that all this is ideological because I, I listened to Philippe from Tilray a moment ago and he's saying there's hundreds and thousands of statistics about cannabis now, but there's still doctors don't believe it because they remember the very first headline, weed is bad. And they, but they won't get it out of their heads 7,000 peer-reviewed stud studies later. And um, from, my, from my perspective, I've talked and talked at length about it for years on end. I've written blog posts about every single facet of the cannabis argument. And we have won the cannabis, the intellectual argument about cannabis hundreds of times. But still it's banned in many, many places. And still you get a picture like in Salvador with, that, with the guys in the combat gear. In South Africa now, things have started to relax, purely because of a few years ago, we all started to hear about Rick Simpson oil. And that was the first time anybody had heard really about so a, 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 a Western form of cannabis medicine as an extract. Because remember, in the, in the valleys that I showed you, there's no such thing as an extract. They wouldn't, they, 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 it's not part of the culture. So Western medicine has played its part in actually managed, managing to free cannabis from total prohibition. So now in South Africa, we have this blanket decriminalization of cannabis users. Since the judge said that stuff's not as bad as we think it is, nobody got arrested that we know of. And there were over a thousand arrests a day in August, and now there's none. So the, the, the police are actually taking it very, very seriously, which is great, which takes a lot off our mind. But every time I hear a conversation about the North, it is always trying to dictate terms to the South. And once upon a time, it used to be for protection, ban cannabis, protect your people from it, and now it's all about the money.
Yeah, and maybe if we can open up to the floor for questions or thoughts on, on the subject. And if, uh, I think the mic is in the back, so. And if we can continue this, uh, these ideas of you know, north-south dialogue and stick to the, these things, that would help. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, again. Yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, Blair Anderson from New Zealand. Our culture <clears throat> is essentially Maori in, in terms of the indigenous people, but they've broadly adopted the Rasta culture, and of course cannabis has come along with that. I'm, I'm aware that there is a following of the Rasta culture in South Africa, and that it's had reasoning and daga as a, uh, an attachment to that. I'd like to hear your comments of how is the change that you've seen impacted on that culture itself, and do you see change occurring um, as a consequence? Good question. Um, what, the, what the, the most remarkable thing about the judgment that we were given by our apex court was it was actually driven by a Rastafarian. His name is Rastafarian Gareth Prince, and he first went to the Constitution in 1999 to claim his rights as a cannabis user, as a sacrament, and study law. And they wouldn't let him because the law said, if you don't abide by our rules, you can't be in our club. But unfortunately for Gareth in 1999, he only did it for one person. He only did it for himself. So now, 20 years later... He went back to court, and Myrtle and I were at his side in the court as co-applicants, and it was such a joyous day for him to, 20 years later, be vindicated, and now he has his application in to be a lawyer and use cannabis. So that was, uh, uh, to answer your question, the Rastafari have been instrumental in changing this around because they march, they shout, they sing and they have some cohesion in every town in South Africa and they are a population group that we can attest to being persecuted beyond belief. If you've got hair that looks like that, the cops are going to come down on you and they do. And a, can and a Rastafarian's always got some weed on them. So they have been very, very persecuted, but I'm happy to say that they are very proud, a very proud group of people now that one of their brothers actually managed to get this through the Constitutional Court with their spirituality in mind. Hi. Yeah. These don't, oh, that one does. Okay, you've got it on. Ah, you're the man with the switch. And this one? Yeah. Yeah, the, the Rasta culture in New Zealand played out, and it's a, a band that has played for something like 25 years, and it regularly has hits, and yet it was called the Herbs. And popular culture in New Zealand adopted this and has consistently honoured Rasta culture in, in, a, you know, in, in acknowledgement across the whole entire spectrum of New Zealand. They're a very famous band in, in, in itself. What I'm getting at is it's groundbreaking to adopt cultural idiom when it hurts no one. Exactly. Um, I've seen time and again a Rastafarian mother blow cannabis smoke on her children on the way out of the door to protect them from Babylon. They do. So when we get shown, well, our detractors say, what about the children? What about the children? Well, what about the Rasta children? They are absolutely fine, and they're balanced and wonderful children, and they get cigarette, uh, tobacco, cannabis smoke blown over them every morning on the way to school. Hello. Hi. Um, I've got a question with regards to, um, if you look at the cultural aspect of cannabis in India, um, how even when I've spoken to doctors in Ayurveda, systems, uh, a lot of them said, oh, we might have studied it, but they're pretty much looking at all other plants as um, key in Ayurveda, but not cannabis. Um, so when I see a lot of this stuff going on in the sort of northern hemisphere, um, and everyone's talking about CBD oil, um, in all my years in Indian culture, we've never extracted the curcumin, uh, just for the curcumin. And um, 
I'm just wanting to know that um, when in Indian culture, all the herbal medicine taking is all about more than one combination herb, combining lots of things together, and not just taking on its own. And then they've got their own philosophy, like the Rasta Ferrin as well. So what I wanted to ask is that, um, are we in danger of losing the real raw aspects of these cultures in the, in the chase for this isolated CBD oils? Uh, and that's in regards to India and... Yeah, India, in, but also any in other communities. Nepal as well. And I think in, yeah, oftentimes in the, in Ayurveda and Hindu, uh, their culture, their medicines, um, they are using uh, hemp in a, a broad, a very broad spectrum. It's often, it sometimes is mixed, as you mentioned. Um, and so uh, they can mix it, they'll make an oil with it, they'll add herbs to that oil, and they'll use it as a salve, uh, very common for arthritis and joint pain uh, that they might have. So these are, these are things that uh, are recognized, I think, in, in these countries. But then the introduction, and, and as you maybe mentioned about introduction of new seeds, it, maybe it's becoming one issue that we have to have dialogue on by bringing seeds from Europe to India, which is something that's happening right now. They're bringing, uh, there's some co groups and companies trying to uh, legalize cannabis in, uh, in India, um, uh, more so than they are in Nepal. I believe the state of Uttarakhand just recently yeah. Uh, was giving legal licenses to people, but they had to use or had to make a low THC variety and are looking at CBD and le looking at other alternatives, textile, industrial production. These are what their goals are. But we also are at risk for losing um, these land race varieties, these seed varieties that uh, we mentioned that maybe aren't really high in THC or, or just multiple benefit plants. And um, how we protect these seeds as commons is going to be one of the most important uh, arguments we can make for uh, yep. the global south. And I just wanted to quickly point out when I've gone to any farming on organic in the UK, and they're saying, get rid of the glyphosate or the chemicals, and I was like, great. I says, let's start having a conversation about hemp, and now it's all the qualities of cleaning up. I've met no one so far in the organic movement in the UK or outside saying, we need to embrace hemp, but it, the talk is only about organics on its own. And I think that's part of the, the block to why this is not moving forward, where hemp should be not just part of the organic, but it should be front and center. Mm. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Linda Hendry, Legalized Cannabis Campaign Scotland. I have quite a lot of experience over the years with Hindus from India, in relation to the previous question, who use cannabis, they're called sadhus. There's no way anybody is ever going to stop them using cannabis. They're a law to themselves. They travel on the trains free. Um, you can see them at Kumbh Mela. Look them up on the television. I mean, on YouTube, they're always in a cloud of smoke. And Bom Shankar. Hi. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, to, I'm here, over yeah. here. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, I was just, I'd like to thank you guys for your contribution because it is true that throughout the whole conference it's sort of seemed that we're talking about cannabis as though it's a monolithic fight that everyone sort of would benefit equally from legalizing, whereas as you all pointed out, there are differences in, in um, agricultural practices and obviously depending on how cannabis is legalized, agribusiness or agroecological methods will, will benefit. And uh, just wanted to thank you guys for um, introducing a bit of a, of a more um, diverse approach to the actual practices of um, agriculture. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I think that's, oh, oh, are we wrapping up? I had a comment on that. I think that's where that's another big step that we, we really have to go, this agroecological practice. We don't know what using cannabis as a mulch, where it is used as a mulch um, in these places. We don't really know this, the science behind it. We know that there, it does do something, but sometimes that data, that information, 
leads a long way to building up the policy uh, and moving forward the policy that these are practices that th they've been doing for a very long time. We have to respect that and find ways in which we can protect that too. And this is gonna you know, m create that dialogue for these people, so thank you. Yeah, thank you for your comment and we're, keep it up. Yeah, we have the last question, please Luca. Um, I also want to thank you for this really, I, I feel like the, this conference is almost finishing and now, like, now we're really starting to talk about uh, like the crucial issues because we are gathering here like uh, many, many years after this plant has been criminalized. And let's not forget this plant has been criminalized for economic and political reasons from the so-called political north and nowadays we're starting to, you know, open up this conversation about uh, why, why is it a good idea to, to decriminalize and legalize this plan? Because there's no longer the possibility to uh, not take this plan into consideration. We're facing a climate threat. Um, our economic system is very, very close from collapsing. Um, now this whole cannabis industry is generating a green rush, which is going crazy. And now the so-called global north is having the idea, oh, maybe, maybe it's a good idea to, you know, go into those countries. Uh, we have been criminalizing people for using engine plants and um, trying to secure um, those uh, licenses. But why are we trying to secure those licenses? I mean, it's not as I see it, sorry for pointing it out, to help people, to help people develop the way they want to and they would have, uh, they, yeah, they would have, but for, again, for economic reasons. So the same reason we started 80 years ago to tell people not to do and not to use it is the reason uh, today to open this conversation up. So therefore, thank you very much for opening this up and. I would love to encourage everyone to to talk about this topic because uh, it's part of the cannabis world and this is the actual potential of this plan, like peace and coming together. And you, you mentioned the cannabis culture and I think this is uh, uh, the biggest hope this, this plan can do because it's uniting people and it makes us peacefully discussing issues uh, that are very crucial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.